Hello again, friends. This will be my last appearance for a few chapters, which I'm sure will be a relief to many of you. And this one will be quick. Before we dive into the grand unification epic of the Big Bang, I want to briefly talk about comments. I'm not allowing comments on YouTube because they usually degenerate into stupid arguments, but I am allowing comments for paid subscribers on my Substack page. The link is posted below. So if you want to chat or ask Sophia questions or give me feedback or even point out typos, I will do my best to read all the comments over there. That's all for now, and I'll see you again a few chapters later. Until then, enjoy experiencing the Big Bang as if you were really there. Chapter 2 the first one hundred trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, the grand unification epoch, 10 to the negative 43 to 10 to the negative 38 seconds. Now let's inch forward just a tiny bit, Sophia said enthusiastically. Let's look at the second Planck time. The universe was now two Planck times old, and it suddenly became two Planck lengths wide in every direction. Sophia continued, because the diameter of the universe grew at least as fast as the speed of light during the Big Bang, and because massless particles like light travel one Planck length in one Planck time, the universe has at least doubled in width and tripled in volume. That is an extraordinary change in size, and because the universe cooled as it expanded, and because the universe behaves differently at different temperatures, we already have our first major transition since popping into a Planck-sized dot from a singularity. And now that we're about to see the universe grow and lots of particles come into being, I should add that the shorter the wavelength of a particle like light, wavelength meaning the distance between two crests of a wave, the more energy it has. As we watch space expand, that expansion will cause the waves to lengthen. And so light, when it comes into existence, will lose energy and cool down, and thus the universe will cool down. I asked, particles will come into being, so God kept creating stuff? No, God did not keep creating stuff. Everything that will ever exist in the material universe was created at the beginning from no prior thing. Remember, if we define the Big Bang as t equals zero seconds, the moment of creation, then everything after the Big Bang is the unfolding of the universe, not its creation. So when new things come into being after that very first instant of creation, they come into being from prior things, from stuff that's already there. When we see new particles come into being, what we are seeing is a tiny bit of energy that had already existed express itself in a new way as a new type of ripple in one of the quantum fields. Yes, okay, I said. So if the universe suddenly burst into several Planck volumes from one, it would cool down a lot, right? Yes, not a whole lot, because everything in the universe is still crammed into an inconceivably tiny dot, but enough to cause a tremendous change in the universe. Which was what? Well, to our astonishment, meaning the angels, yes, well, we couldn't believe how this perfect little Planck epic universe suddenly grew bigger. It was perfect as is. Why did it need to be bigger? Of course, as newborn angels, we didn't really know yet what big or small was. Still, we were amazed that a thing could even change in size. But there was an even greater shock. Which was which was that the perfect symmetry of the Planck epic universe was broken. And what does that mean? Symmetry is a kind of balance. The human body is symmetrical because the left and right sides of the body are mirror images of each other. Well, the single force field that we saw in the Planck epoch, the superforce, broke in two. Like I said, the contents of the universe change with temperature. Think of ice melting. That kind of temperature-induced change is called a phase transition 
because it changes matter from one phase, such as solid ice, into another phase, such as liquid water. Matter can change from solid to liquid to gas to plasma depending on the temperature. In a similar way, when the whole universe tripled in size in the second Planck time, it went through something like a phase transition, a phase transition that was so important that I had to move the clock forward just one tick so you could see it. What happened is that the beautiful symmetry of the superforce was broken into two different forces, and thus began a great war in the heavens, the war between gravity, which draws all things together, and the pressure of radiation energy, which pushes everything out. The whole history of the universe is written in this struggle between push and pull. At the beginning of the first 100 trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, the superforce was torn in two, with gravity going one way and the grand unified force, which is the strong and weak nuclear forces and electromagnetism combined, going the other way. That's why this era is called the Grand Unification Epoch. It refers to the period, which only lasted that 100 trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, when these three forces could be described by a Grand Unified Theory, or GUT. So now there are two opposing forces. Gravity is like a doting mother who wants to gather all her children close. Radiation energy is like her rambunctious children who want to go out and explore. This tension, this conflict, was strange to us angels, but utterly fascinating. We realized at that moment that God was telling a story, and we couldn't wait to see what was next. And what was next? Okay, now that we've seen this first and most important phase transition, I'll show you the next 500,000 Planck times that composed the Grand Unification Epoch. Thank goodness, I said, we're finally on our way. You're welcome. By the way, can you actually let me see something, Sophia? Either I've gone blind or everything is still pitch black. What's the deal with that anyway? TV shows and pictures show the Big Bang as a blinding white light bursting into red and blue flames with lightning bolts and sparks and whatnot. She said, It's because I'm showing you the Big Bang as a human would see it, if somehow invincible enough to survive the process. The human eye can only see a narrow slice of the electromagnetic spectrum. Which means light, I asked. Yes, and remember, like all fundamental particles, light particles are waves in a field. From shortest wavelength to longest, electromagnetic radiation is divided into gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet light, visible light, infrared light, microwaves, and radio waves. Photons are ripples in the electromagnetic field, but there is no electromagnetic field right now only the grand unified field and a few other fields. But even if there had been photons of light during the first trilliseconds of the Big Bang, they would have been invisible to humans because their wavelengths would have been near the Planck length, which would mean all light in the universe would have been at the extreme end of the gamma ray part of the light spectrum, which is far beyond what humans can see. So if you could withstand the pressures, temperatures, and mayhem of the Big Bang, which was trillions of times beyond that of every nuclear weapon on Earth blowing up in your face, you still wouldn't be able to see anything because the wavelengths were way too small to register in your retinas, and the light would instantly blind you even if they could register. I get that, I said, but can we at least pretend, since I apparently already have a superhuman invincible body, that I can see something? Tell you what, let's compromise. I'll let you see particles, but against a black background. Yes. But not just yet. What? There's one thing I must show you when the universe was an orb much bigger than a Planck volume, but still trillions of times smaller than an atom. Let's go halfway through the Grand Unification Epoch. 
She paused time there. My body was back, a very tiny version of it, and I was sitting cross-legged in something that felt like a perfectly spherical black glass ball. Sophia hung a little light bulb from the top of the orb so we could at least see ourselves. She was a glowing red butterfly, which allowed me the space to sit on the bottom of the orb with my head in the exact center of the universe. She said, I can't let you see all the particles filling the universe yet because that would block your view. This is an essential lesson. I asked, why is the universe an orb right now? The universe will always appear as an orb to an observer. And the observer, no matter who or where he is, will always find himself in the middle of the orb. And that's what we need to talk about. First, let's define observer. Observer, in the cosmology sense, or in astronomy, basically means receiver of radiation. So anything in the universe can be an observer. Now, humans can't reach out and touch objects in the universe without flying to them, and they can't fly very far. Therefore, we, and by we I mean humans, not angels, need signals to come from those objects and arrive at our bodily senses or at machines we make to imitate our bodily senses in order for us to know anything about them. This is the only way humans can know anything about the universe, by receiving light or other radiation, such as gravity waves or alpha particles in the form of cosmic rays, from distant objects. Fortunately for you humans, everything in the universe either radiates light and or has a gravitational effect. This means that the whole universe talks to us. It sends us signals of one form or another, all at the speed of light, because both light and gravity travel at the speed of light. Alpha particles are a tiny fraction slower than light, but they still travel at basically the speed of light. When a human or any other object in the universe receives a signal, it becomes an observer of that signal. Now, because light and gravity signals from the universe travel at the speed of light, the farther away something is, the longer it takes the signal to reach us. This means that the farther away an observer looks, the farther back in time he looks. That's essential to remember. So I want you to observe this small dark orb we're in. What's outside the orb, I asked. Remember, there is nothing outside the orb. Just empty space? No, not even empty space. Empty space is something. There is literally nothing. Not blackness, not blankness, not up or down, or any kind of space, empty or not, outside the orb. You can't get outside the orb. The orb is the universe, and there is nothing outside the universe. Then what is the edge, and why is it an orb? The edge is the beginning of time. And the center, where you, the observer, are, is the present moment in time. This is how space-time is shaped. It's shaped this way because no matter which direction you, the observer, look, you look back in time until reaching the edge of time, hence orb. Now, I want you to reach out and touch the edge, which I did. By doing this, you are reaching back in time to the beginning of the Big Bang. Oh, I said with delight. Okay, I get it, I think, maybe. It takes time to get the hang of this view of space and time, Sophia reassured me. But the more you meditate on it, and the more you observe distant objects, the more it will make sense. So be patient with yourself. We'll explore this more when the universe gets bigger and there are more objects to observe. I knocked on the back wall just to say I knocked on the beginning of time. Ow! It's hard, isn't it? Sophia said. There's no give there. The beginning of time is as hard as an edge can be because nothing exists beyond it. 
I said, I know what you mean, but I still can't help thinking something has to be outside the orb. You should train yourself to think of the shell of the orb as the beginning of both space and time, so there is no space outside it, and there is no time before it. If you absolutely need something outside the shell to ease your mind, then you could say it's God. What's the foamy, sticky stuff on my knuckles, I ask, just now noticing. I'm letting your imagination see the quantum foam of the Planck epoch. Your knuckles reached back into the Planck epoch when you knocked on the beginning of time. It wasn't literal foam. I know, I said. It's an image to help me understand. I like it. Good. Remember, everywhere you look, you're looking back in time. So everywhere you look, you'll see the Planck epoch at the far edge. From your current perspective, the Planck epoch has now been stretched out into a thin shell. The Planck epoch hasn't literally been stretched out into a shell, but that's how it appears to you, the observer who has traveled forward in time beyond the Planck epoch. And the farther we travel in time, the farther away and the bigger that shell will get. Just beyond that thin film of the Planck epoch is the hard limit of the singularity that almost broke your hand. Okay, I think I get it, but you keep saying the universe looks like an orb, so it's not really an orb? If the universe is finite and you had angelic eyes that could see everything immediately and without the need for light to travel to you, you wouldn't see the back wall of time or anything at all as it was in the past. Instead, you would see everything as it is in the present. You would see mirror images of you, me, and this light bulb scene extending in every direction forever. Not because there are an infinite number of these scenes, but because space would be curved and you would loop back to this one and only scene. If, on the other hand, the universe is infinite, then you wouldn't see yourself, you'd just see an infinite expanse of empty space. In either case, the size of the universe would simply refer to the distance that has grown between the farthest two points that can observe each other by sending radiation. That's way too much for my mind to handle right now, I said. Then just stick with the way the universe actually looks, which is an orb of look-back time. That's all scientists have to work with anyway, the world as it is experienced by an observer. Now, if you're ready, I'm going to run the clock again, slowly, and let you see the particles that are filling the universe. I'm ready, I said. Suddenly I saw a furious sizzling of red, yellow, blue, and green particles zipping around like Christmas lights in a blender, crashing into each other in dizzying ricochets and spirals of chaotic sparks. And when I mean densely packed, I mean everything in the universe in a tiny ball that was still... How big is the universe now? We're about halfway through the grand unification epoch, so we're still billions of times smaller than the nucleus of an atom. How big is the nucleus of an atom? If you took an apple and made it the size of the earth, an atom making up the apple would be the size of the original apple. The size of the atom is defined by its electron cloud, which is the area in which its electrons will be found. But the atom's nucleus, which is a handful of tiny particles called protons and neutrons, around which the electrons travel, is much smaller and is buried deep within the center of the electron cloud. If you made that apple-sized atom as big as an extra-large football stadium, the nucleus would be the size of an extra-small bead. Got it, I said. And what's going on right now? Right now, the universe is shattering into different fields now that the expansion of space and time have decreased the temperature and allowed greater degrees of freedom. These fields, including the gravitational field and the grand unified field, are being flooded with the innumerable exotic particles you see now. These particles themselves are the shattered remnants of the one superparticle that filled the superforce field in the Planck epoch. What are these particles? 
Scientists are unable to create energies this high on Earth that can create particles that would inhabit a grand unified world. So they are unable to define such particles in their behavior. And so I too will leave it at that. I protested, I wish you would just tell me how things really happened. She said, I have not been sent to give you new revelations, but only to give you a tour through what humans already know so that you can report this to Hava. So right now, I can only say that there are probably gravitons, which carry the gravitational force, X and Y particles, which carry the grand unified force, along with their antiparticles, and perhaps other exotic particles, such as inflatons and the GUT version of Higgs bosons, quarks, and leptons. And because of the extreme conditions, in addition to bouncing off each other, many of these particles are changing into each other or annihilating each other. Maybe there were dark matter particles too, although it is uncertain when dark matter began to exist. All the particles in this epoch were massless, so they all traveled, or rather jostled since there was no room to travel, at the speed of light. All particles without mass travel at the speed of light. What are antiparticles? They are particles that are exactly like their normal twin, but they have opposite charge. When they meet, they annihilate each other with a flash of energy. Some particles, like photons, which don't have a charge, are their own antiparticle, meaning there is no difference between the twins. I was silent, mesmerized by the buzzing commotion of colors crashing, annihilating, or turning into each other. She continued, As you can see, nature is a theater of change. There is no part of space at any point in time that is not changing. You must understand this in order to understand the universe. There is no Planck time or Planck volume that is ever the same. Even empty space is changing. Changing in its position in time, changing in its size, changing in its share of different energies as the universe expands. What's the significance of the different colors, I asked? Fundamental particles aren't actually colored, I'm just giving you something to look at, as you requested. Oh, got it. We were quickly approaching the end of this very brief epoch. She continued, Now let me take you to the end of the grand unification epoch and into the inflation epoch, when the most important event in the early universe took place. This better be good, I said. Oh, it's beyond good. For those with eyes to see, it's the whole universe, the grand design.